Want to collect some nutritious food ideas? Clip them from Catelli Spaghetti. Maytag Jet Clean Dishwasher and get a $25 cash factory refund directly from Maytag with this free certificate we give you. Also cash in with instant discounts on Maytag heavy duty washers. Save on energy efficient Maytag dryers too. Hurry, save money on Maytags during our Maytag savings cash in. Save money on Maytag washers, dryers and dishwashers now at Combined Services North Vancouver and Varsity Washer Vancouver and Richmond. Webster is next on BCTV. Good morning. The BC telephone strike, the dispute goes from bad to worse. There is no sign of any break in it. The province is covered with flying squads. The whole industry is covered with hostility. There are thousands of people out of work because of the strike and the economic pressure on business is quite considerable due to the lack of proper phone service and the lack of installations. Even the interference or the suggestions by the Federal Minister of Labour has done nothing it would seem to improve the climate for a possible settlement. Leave that aside. There are some very unfortunate people in the middle. There are 2,300 or so supervisory people, some of whom are within an organization called TEMPO, the Telecommunications Employees Managerial and Professional Organization. They are a union, but they're not certified. And I have two men from TEMPO here this morning to tell me how they feel about being in the middle of this bitter dispute. And the two men are Farrell Hopwood, who is the chairman of the executive of Temple, and John Yarmack. That's on the heavy side this morning. Then we're going to go up country with reporter Steve Wyatt. And I might introduce it by saying that deer and elk are beautiful to look upon. And had we only had them to look upon, they'd be a great success indeed. But they are ruining in the Creston area, in the Kootenays and in the Okanagan, acres and acres of valuable fruit trees. And some people would like to get helicopter gunships and mow down these beautiful, friendly, tame deer. That's from Steve later. Also in the studio this morning, a man who looks almost, sounds almost, and is an expert and one of the great politicians of our era, old Churchill. And the expert, of course, is James C. Humes who's going to entrance you with Churchilliana. And then for uh, uh, glamour guest, which will be mad when I say that, is the leading lady from British Airways, or Roz, short for Rosalind, smile Roz, Hanby. But first the temple people after the break. <laughs> How does it feel to be the men in the middle who are still working in the telephone dispute? Let's go straight at Farrell Hopwood, chairman of the ex executive of Tempo and say, how do you feel about it? Well, I think uh, myself, and I think I speak for our 700 members, Jack, we don't feel very good about it at all. What can you do about it? Very little. Very little indeed. John well, Yarmack, you're a member of Tempo. How, can you, how long can you stand this? Forgetting Tempo for a moment, as supervisors who are working God knows how long and how hard behind picket lines and pursued by flying squads to keep the phone system going? Personally, it's uh, not a very hard for me because I'm in a position that's inside an office and it's physically not too tough. But a lot of my friends out there are, are suffering and it's very hard. They've been working a long time, long hours, and it's, I don't know how long they can last. Make lots of overtime. 
You pay lots of income tax. You get 60 cent dollars though. 60 cent dollars. Now, tell me about Temple, because I remember maybe a couple of years back, you seemed to be a stronger organization than you were now. What, what is Temple? Are you a trade union? Yes, we are. We've been recognized by the Canada Labor Relations Board as a trade union, but we've never been certified. Uh, we did have a vote for certification back in 1979, in the summer of 1979. And we just lost that vote by 2%, 48% for, 52% against. Of the total 2,300 of them? At that time, the, the, the group of people that were eligible was about 18 or 1,900. Mm -hmm. And you lost that certification vote? We lost vote. that certification vote. So now, how many members do you have? We have 700. So you've only got less than a third of the members. We now, why is that? Is it because managerial and professional people tend to stand back a little bit from unions and the classification of being a union man? That's true. That is the main reason. I think that uh, managerial people are by, very, by their nature very conservative people and they're very difficult to organize. And as you can appreciate, they're in conflict with unions almost daily when the questions of disputes that are going on. And uh, it conjures up visions of, uh, of problems that they think we may have when we become a union in dealing with the employer. Well, and you name an object though. If you were certified for all these people now as a union, would you be out on strike too? No, we would not be. We would be dealing separately on a separate bargaining unit and therefore separate negotiations. But if there were a picket line and you had been certified as a union, then you'd be out. Well, the question then remains is about the essential services of the telecommunications industry and providing that the essential services of the telecommunications business for British Columbia could be defined so that those things were adequately protected, uh, then I would assume that uh, if our members would agree to this, we would be honoring picket lines. Yeah, but of course, essential services are not recognized as such off the bat by the Federal Labor Court, are they? No. I mean, provincially, an essential service is uh, defined as such, and the Labor Board can order certain people to cross picket lines. That's correct. Uh, surely the company must be scared witless of you people being a successful union, because, in fact, you'd be outside the picket line, too, and the telephone company would close down. That really has to be decided. Yeah, you, you, there's a question, Jack, that uh, our people, when we speak like this, we're speaking more as a small group. But all of these things would have to be ratified by a broader membership. And uh, we feel quite responsible for the uh, operation of the telephone business as supervisors. We would much prefer, in a dispute of this nature, that the people, the classified people, the existing union people, would look after essential services. And those of us who supervise them would be alongside of them doing it. Mm -hmm. But we would prefer not to be taking their jobs if it was at all possible not to do so. Now, uh, have you any opinions, either of you, on the rectitude of which side? For instance, McFarland can make out a good case for his 39%. The union can make out a good case that they want the PEC report and that Regan's on their side on the PEC report. Are you guys in a position to tell me which position you would take to settle a strike? No, it, we couldn't, Jack. We don't have the knowledge or the expertise to be able to give you an intelligent answer on a thing like that. Yeah. I don't think the average employee can out there either. It's so what do you hear from the centers around the country on your news line about what's happening? On news line and friends from both sides of the line, Nanaimo, people are, ha they can't stay in town. They have to drive 10 miles, 10 or so miles to and from work. They're in a locked office and they stay in a locked motel and they're, some of them are Forced to be forced to go down the road at 15 miles an hour with picket cars in front and picket cars behind, and they go in their lock motel. And they eat, sleep, and go back to work the next day, and they're feeling very badly. There are tires being uh, tire valves being cut, uh, compounds being blockaded by whoever. The strain is great, and especially the strain I would say on the people that have been working outside. Some people have been working outside since July. August to September of last year mm -hmm. at 60 hours a week. And there's no doubt, of course, that the flying squads are within the law, they're legal, and that when somebody goes out to using the nasty word scab, that the flying squads are there for the purpose of closing down as much of the operation as they legally can. That's true. Do you feel like a scab, Farrell? Not at all, no. Are you inside or outside? I'm outside on residential repair in Burnaby. So you get chased by flying squads? I do periodically, but so far I've had no problems at all. They're just doing their job as they're as we would expect them to do. It must create a lot of bad feelings. It does, unfortunately. It does create a lot of bad feelings between us and the people whom we normally live with every day in our, of our lives working. <coughs> and we're very upset about it, Jack. Well, you can answer this question for me. Is the telephone, I have no problem, touch wood, with telephones. Uh, can the telephone company be accused? Can McFarlane be accused 
of hiring, and this is one of the union's great beefs, a, an increasing number of supervisors for the very purpose of strike breaking? I don't think so. You I don't, don't think no. so? No, I don't think so, no. I think that the difficulties there, as a matter of fact, as you can appreciate, if there's another 2,300 people that are eligible for a bargaining unit, uh, some of these people, uh, I think it's a failure on the part of the employer and the union in order to come to terms on whether those people should or should not have been in a bargaining unit. Well, this is a jurisdictional quibble. This, uh, this is part of a jurisdictional And what the union quibble. says is every time a new position is created or whatnot, it's always taken out and becomes a job of a supervisor. There is now, though, a process which they can go through, which is agreed upon uh, between the company and the union and the Canada Labor Relations Board, mm -hmm. that where that can be looked after. The, any new position that's created, it can be challenged by the union. Uh, the union says that there used to be one to 18 employees with supervisors, and now it's one to three and a half to four. It's quite obvious that with your help, though, and the help of the other non-tempo members of the supervisory and managerial staff, that the phone company can be run. That's true. Yes, it can. For how long? I really don't know, Jack, but I think for a little bit longer anyway. Mm -hmm. So you're stuck in the middle. Ham yes. Ham the sandwich. How many hours a week? 60. We're required to work 60. There's a few exceptions they're making, but most of us are required to work 60. Tell you what I'm going to do just now. You guys are not in a position to declaim very strongly on who's right and who's wrong. But I haven't done an open line shot on the telephones yet. Let's tell me how the telephone dispute is affecting you and how it should be settled. Short, sharp, succinct calls. I'll involve the temple people if I can immediately after the break. <laughs> Would it be fair to say you are, you know, you, you, you want to certify a union? Would it be fair to say, though, that the company has always settled very generously with the managerial and professional people without any quibbles? In recent years, yes. Why do you think they do that? Well, I think that's because we're attempting to organize managers. Attempting to people. organize a union. That's right. Have you, and, but of course, as, as the supervisory personnel, you pick up all the benefits and fringes negotiated by the bargaining power of the TWU, don't you? We pick up many of them, that's true. For which you are truly grateful, I yes, suppose. Sir. Yes. <clears throat> hey, what about this working 60 hours a week? Do they have to get special permits for that, for you people? Yes, they do. That's something we're investigating right now. And from far as we can tell, uh, they're working on a, a ministerial authorization that was issued back in 1967. And we're not sure it's valid because the law has been changed since that time. You'll do it if it's valid, but you're not happy to do it if it's not valid. Are we, uh, if it's not valid, we will be challenging it, and we will be asking most of the supervisory people whether or not they want to continue on that basis. Okay, I'll go to this one. What do you want to say about the telephone company? Um, I'd like to uh, say that I think it should be nationalized, and um, I was just wondering if uh, people in unionized offices might be getting so frustrated that they'll uh, start messing up their switchboards on purpose uh, to uh, bring out... Uh, Flying squads. To bring out flying squads. Well, I don't know about that, but I asked the Prime Minister the other day, what about Canadianizing or socializing the telephone companies owned outside the country? And he said, why should we do that? We can't run the post office. Well, I think in Alberta their record's quite good uh, from what I've heard. But uh, nationalization or socialization is only a, an empty dream at the moment. Wouldn't you agree? I would agree. You, John? Yes, certainly. Go ahead, please. Hello there. Hello. Yeah, it's you. Oh, yes, thank you. I'm a member of the TWU, mm -hmm. and I'd just like to ask Mr. Hopwood, um, I, I would feel that if the Temple members followed the example of one of the uh, supervisors, I'm not sure where in the Kootenays or the interior, but he um, refused to do any overtime or to do any other duties. That is performed by someone in the bargaining union. I feel if the, if the 700 Temple members, or however more they could get, followed his example, I know he was suspended, but I, I feel that the Temple members should make one decision or the other. I don't think they should be in the middle. They should either be with management or they should be with us. And I would stake two weeks of my gross wages that if they stayed off the job for two weeks, this thing would be over. What about the people of British Columbia? Do we abandon the total telecommunications system just to be on one side or the other? 
Well, they've waited two weeks, or they've waited longer than two weeks. No, I don't see how another two weeks is going to affect this one way or another. The system can is deteriorating so fast now, it's not going to make any difference. Can you confirm that one guy has been suspended as a supervisor for Several refusing have. to work? Several, Several have. For refusing to work any overtime? Yes. They may not be suspended. Well, as far it's very difficult to find out exactly what's happened to them, but they have been told to go home and they will be called. Uh -oh. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to ask him about the morality of supervisors working out of their own homes involving their wife and family and using their personal cars and not reporting to work at all. Because that's what I think is disgusting about the scabs. Just a minute. You mean to say that these guys have got their equipment at home and they're going straight from their homes to jobs? That's right. And I've got pictures to prove it with telephoto lenses. Well, I really don't want to comment on that because I don't know who they would be. Uh, I would say most of the supervisors, 90% or perhaps 95% of them, are working out of company premises. Uh, if you go to any of the lockout dispute headquarters, they can show you the pictures and prove it in all the areas. Not just one, but all the areas. It's not that much different from working out in the office, except I suppose you're less visible, eh? Sure, but they're involving wife and children involved with it, what? which is disgusting. Are you picketing the houses? Huh? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> go ahead, please. Hi there, Jack. Yeah. Uh, I'd like you to ask the gentleman there uh, this morning if uh, they're all concerned about the stress and everything that's going on there. Like, I work for the telephone company, you know, I'm in the union. And if they're concerned about the stress, they're not too concerned about the big paychecks, though. That seems to be making up for more than the stress, because the okay. Telecommunication Workers Union offered to support them if they didn't cross our picket line when we went on strike. And to not, we would not go back to work until they were uh, taken back to a man if any suspensions were to take place. Let me get that. The, the t TWU said to the supervisors, if you don't do overtime or don't do our jobs, we will not go back to work until you're properly protected. That's right. Every single one of them. Okay, hold on. Well, that would still be a banning if the majority of the supervisors abandon the telephone company. This time, I ask that question again. What happens to all the people out there in telephone service? You know, where is the principal? It happens to me now, and I'm sitting here waiting for my garbage yeah, you know, picked up, and it's piled Fattel up has around a good my point. house, or my sewer's plugged up, or any other strikes that take place. Or you're the Safeway's on strike, and they're closed. The you money. can't buy food. What do they do? Emergency calls. Hey, what about uh, the money? The money, we would rather not have that money. And if we can get, uh, if we can get uh, our hours reduced legally through the labor minister to 37 and a half hours and have our normal take-home pay and only provide uh, emergency work and be on a call-out overtime for whatever is necessary, we would be happy. We don't like taking this money one iota. Well, then what about the labor board ruling is saying that you're not forced to do any job that's being struck if you're in management position? Uh, why can the supervisors not refuse on that ground? And uh, if there's any suspensions, the union will be more than happy to represent everybody. Thanks for your call. Yeah. Go ahead, please. It's noisy. Go ahead, please. What are you? Gladys? I'm in Burnaby. Okay, well, speak up. Well, I'm trying to, and what I'm trying to tell you is I'm a former union organizer, I'm a retired construction worker and former contractor, and I've sat in negotiations over many years. And there's one thing that I think the cabinet of uh, the social credit government should get off their hind ends and force the telephone company to go back with the unions to negotiate. They have the Peck report. You're only wrong on one the thing. You won't go along with it. It's not the social credit government. It's the federal government. Well, they can step in because I say it's this right now. It's a federal jurisdiction. They can force them back to the uh, bargaining table, and they should do it, Jack. Well, there was a conciliator or a mediator brought back in again. Kelly came back in. And Kelly came, said he'd done the best he could, and the telephone companies I had a call, I hope I get this accurately, tied their wage settlement to an additional increase from the CRTC on the rates. Isn't that right? I believe so. Thank you, sir. But it's federal government, not provincial. One more section with the men from Tempo after the break. To the men from Tem Tempo, Hopwood, and Yarmouth, have you settled for 1981's wages? Have you been given a package? We have 81? been given our wages, yes. How much did you get extra? It basically starts around, averages around 10%. 10%? Yes, sir. Not 12? Some may get 12, some may get less, some may get 8 or 9. And last year you got what? We also had a basic 10%. Mm -hmm. So you're doing not too badly. You're not no. unhappy with your wages on normal working hours? Not really, no. But you concede that it's the pressure of the union that makes them look after the supervisors. That helps, yes, of course it does. 
from Penticton. Go ahead, please, to Mrs. Morning, Hudson. Jack. Uh, Gordon Wall here from Penticton. Uh, I'm a member of the TWU. I would just like to quote, Jack, if I might, a very, very quick and short letter. As of today, February 14th, 1981, several BC TEL supervisors have refused to do TWU work while they, we are on strike. Five of these supervisors have refused by quoting, and I quote, Jack, the Canada Labor Code, Section 184, Paragraph 3C. Suspend, discharge, or impose any financial or other penalty on an employee or take any other disciplinary action against an employee by reason of his refusal to perform all or some of the duties and responsibilities of another employee yeah. who is participating in a Who's strike that is not prohibited by this part. Okay, in other words, you're telling me why doesn't the tempo take the line that the Canada Labour Code says you don't have to do struck work and you can't be suspended or disciplined for it? That is correct, yeah. Well, why? All right. I would just also like to just add, I heard these both these fellows say the money isn't important. Well, if it's not that important, gentlemen, why don't you donate all this big money that you're making on overtime to the TWU strike fund? We well, could sure as heck use it. All right, leave that aside for a moment. Let's deal with the legal part. Well, first of all, we're representing both of those people who have uh, chosen not to work. We believe this is their right, a right of conscience, and we believe the Labor Code is pretty clear and explicit on that, and I agree with you on that. But I asked the same question I mentioned to another caller just a moment ago. What happens to the telephone service in British Columbia if 2,300 supervisors refuse to work? Well, now, what would... No, refuse to work overtime, he said. Oh, all right. That's we will, we're hoping to be able to be in that <clears throat> position once we can challenge the company's certificate or permission What the difference minister. would it make to the maintenance if the supervisors were only working the 37 and a half hour normal week? I have personal feeling, Jack. I Hold on, I want to hear it's from John Yarmack. Heck of a lot quicker than it is. Probably would, but let's see what John Yarmack says. First of all, the company has said that your normal job disappears under these circumstances. So there's no normal work to do. See. Okay. So but in now, fact, if you though, choose not to work, you stay home full time. Mm -hmm. These people are not working 37 and a half hours. They're they're staying home full time. Oh, I see. The company's uh, the company's rule is you must work 60 hours or stay home. If all of us chose to uh, to take advantage of the Canada Labor Code uh, clause here then uh, I would think that the telephone business would go downhill in about two days. The you mean it would be cl it if would the just supervisors collapse. didn't work at all, it would That's be closed? Of course, yeah. it would collapse. And you're asking the question of some kind of ethics or morality, is anyone entitled completely to close down a Ex telephone system exactly. in BC? Exactly. We'd, We'd certainly force the federal government to pass legislation. Well, we feel if we could get down to a 37 and a half hour week and only do that overtime, which is essential emergency overtime, this would essentially work out to, as far as we can do in pulling a lot of people in the company would be just emergency repair service. It wouldn't last too long. Much obliged. Go ahead from all of our BC. Jack, these uh, first level supervisors, this temple rhetoric is getting definitely boring. This has been going on for a long time and talk is cheap. If these people really felt anything for the union members, uh, they would show some respect. They respect not our position, uh, nor the position that our families are in right now. And when we go back to work, they are sure going to find a lack of respect from the workers. And this thing is really going to escalate when we go back to work. As far as I'm concerned, these first-level supervisors have a cakewalk right now as opposed to what they're going to have when we do go back to work. You're talking about hostility, difficulties, and all that kind of caper. Well, Jack, they're showing us no respect. 700, 700 employees of Temple can make any decision they want right now. That's how unions were started, by bands of people getting together with a certain idea. Okay, you made your point. How about a response? It's going to be tough if, what he, if the bitterness is so bad now, not just between the company and the union, but between the members and the supervisors. That's true. We appreciate that. You yeah. appreciate that. Yes. Life is going to be miserable for you when this is over. Yes, I personally, though, work with, I deal with customers with their phones out of order. Every day I talk to customers, and they're very appreciative that we can fix the phone for them. There's a lot of, we work on a switchboard where there's 911 emergency calls. We can't shut those things down. Ambulance calls, those have to carry on. Would the union concede that essential services must be maintained? Hey, eh? Jack, for yeah. the amount of work that these supervisors are doing, they could be doing it in the seven and a half hour day. That's what we're pursuing. 
They don't have to be working the we overtime. That. Say mm -hmm. that again. We believe that. We believe we could keep essential services going. What's for, the state of your protest? Why uh, don't you do that? We're waiting to find out from the Labor Minister the status of the company's existing authorization to work as extra hours over and above for a 48-hour week or 40-hour week. How are you going to bring that to a head, though? Well, uh, there's two ways we can handle it. If their authorization is no longer valid, we can challenge, challenge it and, uh, and tell the minister we only want to work our normal work week and thereby refuse the company to force us into a 60-hour week. If it is valid, there's a section in the code which we can challenge. We can challenge an existing permit. But wouldn't you look an awful lot better as a putative union if your 700 members said we're not going to work 37 and a half hour a week? Then you'd have to be sent home. Yes, the difficulty is getting those 3,700 together Seven. to have... No, you're 700. Uh, pardon me, these 700 people together in order to assess their uh, feelings on it, to get a vote on a thing like that. So you don't really well, know... You put a phone number on the screen. You'll have those 700 supervisors phoning you immediately after this show. They are fed up. They will withdraw their services. Just as well, the phones services. are still... Would be just as well, the phones are still working. <laughs> anyway, that's my explanation of that. Go ahead, please. What are you? Yes. That's you. Yeah, Mr. Hopwood. Uh, you realize that uh, companies run in this lockout on the backs of the supervisors. And uh, can you deny the, the massive, I say massive, public and political support for the union? I, I really don't know. I know the union uh, has some popularity because I'm in and out of homes every day fixing phones. But by the same token, I run into people who are against the union position. So I couldn't say that I deny or agree with a statement like that. I would say offhand that the image of the company has deteriorated since the, since the occupation of the post offices by the, of the, offices by the union. Certainly, the uh, company uh, doesn't and one more question here. Why are you people doing the new work if you're so interested and, and uh, concerned about emergencies. If, if emergencies are your priorities, why are you doing sea work? We are, as many instances as we can, we're insisting upon it with dispatchers. We want to do emergency work first. We don't want to do sea work. I, to date, for three weeks, have not done one speck of sea work, mostly all repair. And the supervisors who are concerned are doing that. However, if we're required by the employer, if we refuse, therefore we're sent home. And uh, I don't think it would be too effective if we make that decision before we know the, how, what condition we exist under law. When will you know the, your position under the law? We've been trying to get Ottawa. We've been on the phone for four days now with Ottawa, and we're getting the runaround from the Labor Department back there. Uh, it seems to be that the last authorization was made in 1967, and it must be in a dust-covered shelf somewhere. And our lawyer is doing his level best to get a decision. Are you telling me, Father Hopwood, that if you get it clearly established from the Labor, uh, Labor Department in Ottawa, 30,000 miles from here, that um, you are not required to do more than 37 and a half hours, and they can't, 37 and a half hours, and if you do only that, they can't suspend you. That's right. You will then cut your members' work or recommend to Tempo that they go back to 37 and a half hours. We will take it to our members and ask them what they want to do about it. We'll recommend that they reduce it. Best I can do for you. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack, and your guests. Uh -huh. uh, I would like to suggest to the, your guests there that possibly if they were to uh, go out with their brothers and sisters on that picket line, this dispute would soon be over because the employer would not be able to do, carry on his work. I think that's correct enough, but you've had the final Secondly, say. Secondly, uh, I would like to suggest to you that the provincial government does have uh, something to say about this with their 28% shares in BC Telephone. And they're sitting back watching things go on. They, ha they have an obligation to the citizens of the province to, who are shareholders with you that maybe... 28%. To do something about it. They won't lift a finger. The provincial government won't lift a finger, will they, Faro? I don't know, Jack. It appears so. Thank you. Now, they were going to leave it for today, but I want you to do something for me. As soon as you get your Labour Board interpretation out of these layabouts in Ottawa, these sleepy people in Ottawa, <laughs> will you let me know? I will. On the air? If you wish, I will. My thanks to you, John Yarmack, 60-hour week man in an office. And to you, the Tempo Chairman of the Executive Committee, Farrell Hopwood, whipping about, followed by squads on occasion. I hope that nothing gets too rough, and I hope that somebody knocks somebody's heads together and settles this damn strike soon. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Change of pace after the break with James C. Humes. I like him already, and I've barely spoken to him. <laughs> Thank you.
You know as much about him as I do at this moment. James C. Hume's funny name, it's a corruption or something, is a former White House speechwriter who has written for three presidents. And he has a thing about Churchill, right? That's right, Jack. You kind of look like the old fellow. Well, if I take my hair off, I do a one-man show on stage as Churchill. But you've written this book about Churchill. That's right. And uh, because no one else has ever written a book or even an article on how Churchill uh, early perceived that the mastery of the English language was going to be his staircase to power and greatness, and then how he set about to develop this mastery and wield it to advance his career and defend the West. Because you see, Jack, Churchill was born, he had a congenital lisp. He once told the, uh, uh, a surgeon, Sir Felix Semple, Sir Felix, how can I ever become First Lord of the Admiralty if I say the word sailor? <laughs> <laughs> And he had a lisp, a stutter, which prevented him from beginning any sentence except with a stammer. He never went to university. And one of the first times he spoke in the House of Commons, he collapsed in a dead faint out of fear. And yet, despite that, he became, as the title of my book suggests, Speaker of the Century. And I submit that's an understatement. Now, there are some of the old stories in here, which On all the of back us... of the book, I have all uh, anecdotes that I tracked down and verified. Did you ever meet the old fellow? Yes, I did. I was uh, 18 and I was introduced to him and the Duke of Edinburgh said, uh, uh, Prime Minister, he's a young man who wants to go into American government. And Churchill sort of reminded me of Charles Lawton at the time. I was 18. He looked at me and he says, young man, study history, study history. In history lie all the secrets of statecraft. And I went back to my room that evening and tore down the picture of Ted Williams and put up Winston Churchill. <laughs> Mind you, was in the not times he was a little bit of a phony on occasion, was he not? Oh, I don't think so. Not at all. I, I think he, he liked, uh, perhaps as you do, to, be, to play the old curmudgeon. You know what, the, what a curmudgeon is. He's but I remember how stupid he was on occasion. I remember after the war when I was one of the ex-soldiers who voted against the old reactionary, despite the fact that he had saved the world for freedom. With a well, little help from think, here and I there. I don't think he was a reactionary. Remember, in the, uh, uh, during the 1900s, he was the architect of uh, what the Americans would call the New Deal. He always... Uh, uh, what is this sacrilege? Yes, Churchill. He, he's yes, the he, he sponsored the pension insurance, the unemployment compensation, uh, Social Security back in... the in, That uh, was Lloyd George. No, he wrote the only... Uh, I have a whole chapter on that. He was the philosopher of the New Deal at the time, and with Lloyd George, led the fight against the House of Lords. He was also the guy who said, what this country needs is an economic system that supplies 12 men for 10 jobs. And for, because of that, my father hated him, having been a worker on the Clyde for the rest of my father's life. Well, I know that he did, uh, you know, uh, bust a, uh, a strike when he was Home Secretary. That's but right, 1926. But, uh, that's right, but basically, uh, he, uh, he fought uh, the citadels of privilege as he well as he felt the, uh, fought the citadels of uh, labor if they were abusing their responsibilities and privileges. Now, what about the time in 1945, I'm sure you'll cover this in the book, or 46 it was, when the Daily Mirror ran the thing, whose finger will be on the trigger? Remember when he was trying to get back into power? Yes, but he was the man who brought summit conference into the English language when in 1951 he said, I now promote propose a parley at the summit. And so here was a man who I think at that time was uh, capable of bridging the gap uh, between uh, the Russians and the United States because he was still the figure who was respected around the world. And I yes, he was a, a man who uh, brilliantly led Great Britain in the war, but he understood that the secret to peace is strength and a good defense. Tell me the story about the phony speech. I mean, that, I was shattered. All right. I mean, I may nag about him, but of course yeah. one has the greatest respect for him in well, every no, possible uh, way. Really, this was the BBC's fault. What happened was Churchill gave the speech that we all know in the Dunkirk speech, you know, we shall fight him on the beaches, we shall fight him on the landing ground. And he gave that speech, and then afterwards he went to the BBC and delivered it for the overseas broadcast. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, Franklin Roosevelt is sitting in the White House at the time, and when he finishes listening, Harry Hopkins, his aide, turns off the radio, and he says to Harry Hopkins, uh, well, Harry, as long as that old bastard's in charge, England will never surrender. It's not like putting money down the rat hole as in France. 
and a neutral United States gave aid. But <clears throat> when Churchill went back from BBC studio, 210 Downing Street, BBC called him and said uh, there was a failure in transcription. Now, although it went over live, they didn't have for the later hour broadcast. And so they brought in Norman Shelley, who was the voice of Winnie the Pooh on radio, and they knew he was a good imitator, and he imitated uh, excerpts of the speech for later broadcasts around the clock. Yeah, that's good. That was good. He died the other day, that Norman Yes, fellow. he died about four months ago. And when the, this thing came up, the BBC called me by telephone and interviewed me on this. Listen, uh, I'm going to talk more with James Humes about Churchill after the break. You're biased, of course, and your book in Churchill has been called a somewhat adoring biography. That's perhaps, right. Correct? Well, I, uh, they, someone said that I couldn't be objective, but I said, look, I'm not writing about Churchill as a uh, social reformer or as a military leader. I am writing about him as a speaker. And if some pygmy revisionist can come along and say Churchill was not a great speaker, then I suggest a sequel on Michelangelo that he was an artist and Beethoven that he wasn't a musician. Was there anybody better within your knowledge as a speaker or in the use of the English language? Uh, not in this century because Churchill's mastery of the English language was uh, proved what Cicero said. He said there are three tests of eloquence, action, action, and action. And Churchill's action was the difference between survival and defeat in 1940 because the United States gave aid because they knew he would fight on. And the Germans, the Goebbels diaries show that Germany did not land because they really believed that if they landed, every farmer would have a pitchfork and every housewife a butcher knife and they didn't land. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in the Iron Curtain speech, you know, when he said... Uh, Oh, Fulton, Ohio. In Fulton, Missouri, you know, Fulton, and I Missouri. gave the 33rd annual Iron Curtain address out there from the same podium. And by the way, on that speech, Iron Curtain wasn't added to the last minute. It wasn't added till he went on the train from Washington to Missouri, and he's there. Uh, Truman shows him this seal that he has designed, uh, changing the eagle from looking to the uh, uh, arrows to the olive branches, and Churchill says, why not put the eagle's neck on a swivel? So he can turn to the olive branches, nor to the arrows if the case demands. And this was prophetic of the speech he was going to give the next day. And Truman says, well, well let's have some whiskey. And, and he's brought Jack Daniels, and Truman says, this is not whiskey, it's bourbon. And so then they had to stop an emergency exit at, at, at Silver Spring, just outside Washington. And they had to go get a case of Johnny Walker Black. And Churchill with Johnny Walker Black... Brought, wrote in that paragraph, which the New York Times and Washington Post missed, the Iron Curtain paragraph, which goes, uh, from Stetchin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an Iron Curtain has descended across the continent of Europe, Prague, Warsaw, Sofia, Tirana, Budapest, Bucharest, and all of these are now within the sphere of Soviet tyranny. It was quite a speech changed the shape it of the world after the war. Because only uh, three months ago, the United States uh, had uh, concluded the World War II with its ally, the Soviet Union. And within a year after that speech, we had a NATO, we had a Marshall Plan, and we had a Truman Doctrine. And he shifted the opinion of the free world. Mm -hmm. Might have been better if uh, Roosevelt, in his dying days, hadn't met with Stalin at Yalta. That is, that is true. Mm -hmm. Enough of that. Back to some Chiliana. I, I saw in the review, because I've just got, seen the book 20 minutes ago. You got the book? <laughs> Show the man the book. He's worth the price of it. And I did that woodcut on the front, too. Yourself? Yes. Yourself. <laughs> uh, give me a couple of definite of his descriptions of well, people. You know the way Do he them slowly. You're too good. You're too quick. <clears throat> the way, way he did uh, uh, describe John Foster Dulles, whose uh, blunt statements put the teeth of our allies on edge, he said, John Foster Dulles? is the only bull I know who carries his own china closet around <laughs> with him. <laughs> or, or, or who else but uh, Churchill with his pictorial eye and impish sense of humor could describe Charles de Gaulle. And he says, Charles de Gaulle looks like a female llama who, who, who's just been surprised in her bath. <laughs> Give me the famous one on... Uh, Montgomery, the British <clears throat> general. You know, there goes Monty, indomitable, in defeat, 
invincible in advance and insufferable in victory. Yeah. You know, you really are good. How long have you been doing this one-man Churchill show? You're well, not about three or four years. You're not, not here. No, I spoke last night at the English-speaking union here in uh, Vancouver. Give me the correct phrasing of the court and democracy. Democracy is the worst form of government, uh, except for every other form that's been tried from time to time. I must remember that, yeah. Now, you went for three U.S. presidents. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and actually dare four, you, counting Reagan. Dare you tell me them? Oh, my. Uh, yes, uh, Eisenhower, Nixon, Ford, and Reagan. It sort of gives away my registration, doesn't it? It doesn't, eh? Eisenhower, who was once described by somebody as an amiable bungler. Absolutely wrong. Eisenhower was neither as genial as people think, nor as stupid. He was shrewd and astute. And he, to work with them, he was a very military and uh, there was no slap on the bike, uh, slap on the back, Ike stuff. Very tough and demanding, very bright, very quick. Nixon. Nixon was an introvert in an extrovert's trade. He was uh, a mechanical uh, with no capacity for small talk at a cocktail party. While working with him, he could be very warm. I enjoyed writing speeches for him. He was uh, very demanding. He would write on the, uh, on the uh, margin, no, I don't believe that, or yes, that's right, uh, that's great. Uh, Ford would... Oh, if we don't finish with Nixon yet. All right. Were you there in the bad days? I was a speechwriter from 69 to 70, went over to the State Department in 70, and went to the, left the State Department in 1972 before Watergate. So got you, Jack. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's an incredible thing we can't understand about the Americanos. In that, oh, you know, horrendous crisis, the Watergate. We give you full credit in that your country, you dig them out, blow them up, and you have enough competitive media that the public generally thinks it finally knows the truth. Unlike this country, where we have no real investigative media that would go after some of the horrendous scandals we've had in this country. But then, when he's caught, he picks a successor who pardons him. Well, in the first place, I helped former President Ford with his memoirs, and I think that was the, the wisest decision that former President Ford made. The, in, as to his picking Ford, Ford was the most logical man to pick. He was, in a sense, the leader of the House of Commons in the party, and therefore it is the, is the legitimate choice. Secondly, uh, <clears throat> John Ehrlichman and Bob Haldeman did not finally uh, uh, go to jail till 1978. Mm. Richard Nixon, with the uh, defenses offered to the uh, chief executive, could have uh, staved off any final conclusion till 1980 or 81. And Ford wanted the healing to begin, and he wanted to turn the page, and he was right. Good response. Uh, Regan. Regan is I the mean, greatest communicator since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He is a a man who projects tremendous uh, human sympathy, empathy, uh, a man greatly underestimated by people, including myself originally. I was originally for George Bush, uh, but he is the greatest communicator, and he alone, amongst anyone in the United States, can, I think, shift the economic direction of government because he is such a good communicator. You mean he's overcome Bonzo? <laughs> That's hey? right. He, he likes Bonzo. He thought it was one of, a very funny flick. Yeah, I'm still not quite up to him. When I hear some of uh, Reagan's advisors talking about the tough line in the world, I shudder just a little. Well, I think uh, I think a, a tough line. I like the uh, cabinet. I like Haig, and I like Weinberger. So, uh, and you obviously liked Bush at one time too. Yes, indeed. Now, the story that Churchill told in British Columbia. Oh, he arrived in British Columbia in the, in the 1930, and uh, the journalist said. Uh, or do you like America, uh, Mr. Churchill? And Churchill said, there are only two things I dislike about America. It's uh, newspapers too fat. And it's toilet paper too thin. <laughs> Very good. What's your favorite stock Churchill joke? Your favorite stock joke, a funny one. <laughs> Well, you, we know when Bessie Braddock, uh, who in 58, and she was all 300 pounds and from Liverpool, liver puddling like John uh, Lennon, 
and she is waddling down the aisle, and Sir Winston, who had spent a little hours with liquid refreshments, is wobbling down the air aisle, and the, the wobbler and the waddler collide, and down goes Bessie for the count, and she pulls herself up off the floor, and she says, Sir Winston, you are drunk, and what's more, you are disgustingly drunk. And the old man looks at Bessie and says, and I might say, Mrs. Braddock, that you are ugly. And furthermore, Mrs. Braddock, you are disgustingly ugly. And what's more, Mrs. Braddock, tomorrow I, Winston Churchill, shall be sober. <laughs> <laughs> James C. Humes, very many thanks for popping in this morning. It's going well, I presume. Yes, it is. It's in its third printing, was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, and uh, it's doing very well. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. I don't often say that to people either, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, next. Dear. Dear. Okay, take it away. Take, take it away. Steve Wyatt's been up country in the Creston area and in the Kutten and in the Okanagan looking at the problem of these beautiful white-tailed mule deer and the elk. And Steve is going to tell you the story about what it's costing. Jack, it's been an unusually mild winter here in the Okanagan and the Kootenays this year. Trees like these in an orchard near Summerland are already budding. That combined with a major replanting effort by BC's fruit growers has attracted a so far unmanageable killer out of the bush. The loss is estimated in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that is the culprit, white-tailed deer. Their population has been increasing steadily in this valley near Creston and in the West Kootenays. Estimates of the size of the herd vary. Orchard owners say it is 1,500 strong, and at least 200 of them live and feed on the edge of the orchards. Another 100 elk are also invading the orchards just three miles from this natural habitat. Orchard owners have recently begun replacing their trees with smaller, more productive plants. It costs them $6,000 to bring every acre up to the stage where the trees will bear fruit. And now that they have begun to bud, they are candy to the deer and elk. A Ministry of Agriculture study conducted two years ago estimates a province-wide loss at $365,000 a year. One victim is Chuck Truscott. Well, these are apple trees. Uh, these happen to be Spartans, a Spartan variety of apple tree. Uh, these were planted last year in April, the first part of April, and started to grow at that point. Uh, now, you go through some pretty careful pruning with these things in the early years. Now, is this a good tree here we're looking at? Yes, it is. It, it requires some very, very careful pruning because the branches down here, which are going to be the main branches for this tree, have not yet fully developed. Consequently, we need to do some cultural things here to encourage that. And with young trees, it's, it's interesting and it's, and it's quite easy to make nature respond to the way you want it to. Now, to make these trees grow here, or these branches grow, we would leave three or four buds in here and trim this at this point. That would encourage these to grow this year, and then next year, this bud here that we left, the top bud, would grow like this has from here and would grow up about three feet, and we would need that type of growth on here so that we can again do some cultural things, take our pruning way up here, and uh, then allow some more branches to come out about two feet above these. Now this is, you're at a very delicate stage right now, is that right? When yes, we are, young, because young we are forming what uh, is going to be our income in future years. Uh, there's been a lot of research gone into it, and it requires some very, very careful handling. It's very easy when you know how, but it does require some very careful handling to make sure that we have these branches coming out at the right area. We want them over about a six or eight inch uh, range and we want five or six main branches coming out, and we have to have that to start. Now, how long does it take for this tree to bear fruit? About five years. Actually, we should have some in three. In three years, I'll nip these uh, buds off, the fruit spurs off, that are carrying fruit so that I don't have fruit growing that year and make this develop. I've planted this on rather wide spacing, so I want my trees to grow for three, possibly four years. Then in the fifth year, I'll allow it to, to produce some fruit. Now show me down here what happens when these animals get down here and start eating the buds. Okay, what's happened here is the, the terminal bud, of course, is a very, very important part of the tree. And the deer have come in and they have taken and they have nipped here. You see that was about this long. They've eaten that down to here. They've taken and, and tipped that off. Uh, they've tipped this one. Now I wouldn't have wanted to do that this particular year, uh, to, do, to tip that, but it's been done. 
The other problem is when they, when they take that off, we found through experience that that has done something to these buds down in here. It's a very delicate balance, evidently. Now I'm going to have to come down in and I'm going to have to trim that back to there. Now this has only had three nips on it. Uh, there are other... Uh, now th this branch is the one that is the crucial one, is it? This one here? Yes, it is, and these. They're, they're all are, are equally crucial, really, but this one here, taking off that terminal bud, has killed the growth. This happening in the winter is serious, but if that happens during the growing season, which of course a lot of mine happened, happened to mine last year in many cases, then I've lost the chance to ever have that produce uh, the way I want it to. I've got to start again and go right down to the bottom and start a new tree. Now a good tree takes five years to bear fruit. How long yes. will this one take now that it's been damaged like this? Well, I've lost a year. Okay, that's, that's this year. And then if it happens again next year, I've lost two years. And with this rootstock being a dwarfing rootstock, if I have setbacks for two or three years in a row, it would seem that my tree is not going to get much larger than just a small bush. So it'll be like a bush, it won't be a, a tree yeah. like we and see. And essentially in I have to replace that. Now the odd one, I can stand that. If I have one tree here and then I have one further over somewhere, I can stand losing that. But I can't stand losing my entire orchard. This has happened, of course, at the top here. I have three acres where this has been eaten right down to here. Now we're walking not 500 feet from your back door. And it's up here where you're having the most of the trouble, is that right? That's right. I have uh, about three acres up in here that follow sort of a natural drainage, uh, and it's a natural path for the deer. And they've come into here, and as you can see from these trees here, uh, they've been practically ruined. They've been nipped. Every bud on them is missing. There isn't a terminal bud left on. How many trees? About 600 trees. I've got them planted about 200 trees the acre here, and there's three acres. How much of a loss does that represent? Oh, I would say a potential loss of about uh, $30,000. So this field up here is almost entirely wiped out then? Yes, it is. Uh, I consider this a complete loss. I'm going to have to start and trim the trees right down within about nine inches of the ground and hope that I can get a new tree started now. Now, why do I see blue on, on this one? Well, this area has uh, been a test for the Ministry of Agriculture for deer repellent. And initially, at the uh, beginning of November, they came over here and they painted uh, anything that was damaged, they painted orange. And then they sprayed it with repellent. They came back in January and counted the number of uh, nips that it had, and this one, of course, has had about six. And they were fresh, so they painted those with blue, and they sprayed it with repellent again. So is this, generally speaking, is the experiment working? Uh, not really. It has not, as you can see. Uh, there's been many, many nips here. The last repellent they put on uh, seems to have worked, but then we've had a lot of pressure on them from hunting. We've done a lot of night shooting here, and uh, consequently, we've done some of that. That's You're shooting them? Yes, certainly we are. Are you supposed to do that? Uh, I don't know. It's my property. I think the best repellent we got is 303, 3030, things like that. Works better than that repellent. How many have you shot? Oh, last summer I shot three here myself, and I think uh, so far this winter we've shot uh, four on this property and one elk. It's not a very popular move. No, but then as you can see, it's not very popular for me either. My bank manager isn't going to like this when he sees this. You have no choice? No, I don't have any choice. Are you still shooting them? Oh, certainly, and I'll continue to do that. George Schuler is a fruit grower and chairman in Creston of the Wildlife Committee for the Fruit Growers Association. Since 1973, they have been feeding the deer and elk. The idea was to establish feeding stations away from the orchards. They have created a monster. The feeding stations have become breeding grounds, producing more and more domesticated animals. Eight years ago, there were 22 feeding stations along this route. There are now six, but instead of finding natural feeding areas during the mild winters, the animals concentrate on their favorite delicacy. Well, it initially started hoping that they, we'd keep the animals out of the fruit growing area, and we, we hoped that we'd keep them back in here. And uh, it how, did, how did it get out of hand? Well, we feel there how it got out of hand is, first of all, we're too close to the valley there, and they're commuting back and forth. And second of all, they're, they're getting too healthy, they're dropping too many young, and that's really making a problem because now we're not fighting with just a few, we're fighting with hundreds now out here. As you can see the marks here, this is the last feeding station here, and we've had 29 elk here that one fellow's counted at, at one time there. And uh, I think about the best here was 14 deer at one time. You've crack. created a monster. I think, yeah, it, the monster's created there now, and we're, we don't know what to do. We, we're scared to quit, because if we quit, they're liable to flood right into the valley looking for feed. Uh, we were hoping that the power line would keep all the brush on it. That's all been taking off this last summer, so we've lost that natural feed. So 
Now, you've, you've had a fairly easy uh, winter this year. It's been a real good winter. Uh, before Christmas, we had lots of snow, and there was lots and lots of game in here, and we really started feeding heavy, hoping to keep them out. Then the snow went, and we still can't keep the game out. They're just flooding into orchards just constantly. Even though the animals have had an easy winter, they're still going for the, the orchards. Yeah, my feeling is they're going into the orchards for the buds because that's their candy. So the animals basically have been domesticated then, is that, is that what's happened? This this is what I feel here because any time you can drive as close as, as I've driven to animals in here and, and uh, got as close to shoot them when you're hunting there, we've really got them tame. What are the solutions in your view? <sighs> well, there's uh, only one sure solution is elimination of them all there, but I'm darn sure nobody's going to want to even think about that one there. Uh, the only other thing there, I guess, is to get the herd size down, opening hunting up more, get it down there so that the animals aren't short of feedback in here, so they'll hopefully stay out. But uh, best, I think, is elimination of them all within a 20 or 25-mile radius of the whole valley there. But that, Open it up to hunters. It's not going to be very popular. Open up to helicopters like in New Zealand. Just fly over and knock them all down. That's, that's a harsh way, but uh, that's about the only sure solution. And nobody really wants to even talk about opening, opening up hunting more than uh, what it has been done. Mm -hmm. So we just don't know where to go anymore. What has the government told you, the people who manage the wildlife? Well, they told us there all they do is manage it. They don't own them. So they said they're, they're busy making new policies there and forming new committees, but they haven't helped us a bit. Uh, as far as rod and gun there, we got funds from them last year. We've got applications in for funds again this year to keep feeding. We ask them if they would want to feed, and they say they can't, couldn't afford it. If it wasn't for the volunteer help and all the volunteer fruit and potatoes, some hay was donated here, and we're spending lots of money out here. Lauren Botterill is 81 years old. He's been a fruit grower on the West Kootenai since 1911. In the last few years, his business has fallen behind. He won't plant new trees until the deer problem is solved. I like this life. I don't work like it I used to. Do you think your lifestyle is threatened now? Well, yes, in a way it is. Because uh, if you can't raise food, what's, what's left? Are the deer really a problem? Well, I would think they're getting gradually worse each year. When did you first notice the difference? Well, uh, it started in about 10 years ago. 10, 11 years. They've gradually been getting worse. Getting worse every year? It's getting worse every year. And I think that's caused from the deer are bred and born right in here. And uh, they just use this as a feeding ground. Now, your trees behind you here were planted in when, 1915? In, in 15, yeah. Now, they need replacing, don't they? Uh, part of them do, yeah. Is it There's worth it? There's here that, uh, that should be replaced. They're, uh, you know, more or less out of date. Is it worthwhile for you right now, though, to replace them? No, I wouldn't replace them now not to really solve this problem for us, mm -hmm. because it's just a losing battle. My neighbor here next door, look what he's got. Mm -hmm. You put in a thousand trees or more, and what do you got left? Now, are they eating your trees as well, the full-grown oh, ones? Yes, the end of the big ones. Uh, I was up through there today, and I find that there's quite a bit of it on the end of the few wood. So there's really nothing untouched around here? Uh, not that I know of. Are you mm -hmm. losing money because of it? Definitely. Definitely losing money. Mm -hmm. First, if, uh, if I could replace these trees here, why, uh, I'd get into the varieties that are more demand for and uh, come into production sooner and uh, get it. But as long as we have this problem here, I won't I'll leave what I have. Now, you've seen a lot of changes in this valley yeah. since you've been around. Yeah, you've what do you think of the government? Are they doing anything to help you out? Well, it doesn't appear that uh, they are. Mm -hmm. it, uh, they what would you like to see them do? Well, I'd like to see them uh, take, and, take a piece of, uh, allow a piece across the back end of these places here and uh, let us uh, get a small uh, subdivision up in there where there's homes built. And the kids and dogs and stuff like that will keep the deer out. Our problem, uh, people to the east of us here, where they've got those houses along that road, they have no trouble. But they've continually disallowed that, have they? Well, up to the present time they have. They keep talking about this, uh, putting in a, the highway along there, which they've been monkeying with for 20 years, and they don't seem like they're nearer getting it now than they were before. They just and can't... putting up a fence 
unless they put steel posts in, they're going to have a problem there. And unless they put a long one, and it's got to be darn long. Mm -hmm. Well, the deer will go around the end of it and come in. But so far, nothing's been done? Nothing. The problem is the same in the Okanagan. This orchard belongs to Tim Deasy. He, too, is in the middle of a major replanting program. He and others have been appealing for help from the BC Wildlife Branch to recover from that $360,000 a year loss. DC is chairman of the Wildlife Committee for the Fruit Growers Association. Can you put a dollar figure on what loss is being taken here by the orchard owners? Um, there was a study done by the Ministry of Agriculture. They gave us a figure of around 360000 a year. Now, why has it become a problem in the last couple of years, the increase in population of the deer? Uh, I think the particular reason probably is that we are moving more and more into dwarf and semi-dwarf trees and um, they will eat the buds and the shoots of those. They couldn't do very much damage on the bigger old apple trees that we used to have. But um, I think too the population of the deer and elk in the Kootenays is increasing. These buds on the smaller trees are like candy to them, I guess. Especially at this time of year, they're full of hormones and they really enjoy chewing them. Is there any solution? There's got to be a solution, yes. We've got to improve the winter range for these animals, get them way back from the orchard areas. We've got to kill out the uh, sort of resident semi-domestic animals that hang around the edge of the communities. Um, we are tried feeding to try and keep them back from the orchards, and I th that may work, we don't know. One other thing we're trying seriously and working at is repellents that we can spray onto the trees, and um, especially in the winter, mm -hmm. taste repellents and smell repellents. And we're having some success with that, but it's slow work. Now, have the wildlife people given any indication that they will take over management of these things? After all, $365,000 a year is a pretty large loss. Wildlife's a peculiar outfit, and that whole Ministry of Environment has us puzzled. They keep telling us that they manage the wildlife, but when we ask them to manage it, they seem to disappear back into the woodwork. No, they do very little for us. And it's apparent now that the, the wildlife is becoming unmanageable to you, I guess. I think so, yes. It's, and it's increasing and going to get worse and worse. I can imagine the screams of outrage if anyone does pick up uh, one of Steve's uh, interviews and get a helicopter and start shooting down the gorgeous mule deer with gunships. But there is a serious problem, there's no doubt about that. And if you were one of the fruit farmers in the area watching your new trees being ravaged by these almost tame pet-like animals, you'd be very upset indeed. Steve is still in the interior, we'll be reporting next from Armstrong, British Columbia. And next I'll be chatting to the face that launched a thousand flights. Roz Hanby of British Airways, after the break. Hi, Roz. Hello. What's your real name? Rosalind. I love this press release, which happened to be, I think, written by an old buddy of mine. We used to work together. She, that's you. <laughs> Don't read it, you'll make me die. That launched a thousand flights. Her picture has been worth a thousand words. This international notoriety must just cover you with warmth and glory. Oh, I sound more like a bunch of flowers in that description, don't oh, well, I? You, do. you look like a bunch of flowers, oh, too. Is that, that really the Union Jack round your neck? It is. Well, it's, it's our logo, actually. Oh, it's your logo. Yes. Looks like a bit of the Union Jack. When it do you is. start to fly out of Vancouver? We're going to fly out of Vancouver on April the 23rd. To? And we're going to, to London. What, not to Prestwick? No, unfortunately not. We won't be able to fill enough aeroplanes. How many times a week? There aren't enough week? Scotch people in... Scotch. Like, how many how times a week? Uh, four times a four week times until a week. June, and then we're going to go daily. Pity you can't use the Concords. Yes, it is rather. Tell me about the Concord. Well, I'm a stewardess on Concord, so it's That's my That's your full-time job? Yes, I mean, I'm still employed as a stewardess. I do a tremendous amount of promotional work all around the world now, so I do partly promotional work and partly flying. Tell me, where do you fly on the Concord now? Only New York and Washington now. How long from London to New York? Well, I think the fastest we've ever done is about two hours, 53 minutes. It's something. We actually work to the minute. It's not sort of rounded off to the nearest 10 minutes. Um, and that was a really quick one. 
two hours and 53 minutes. What difference does that make in your jet lag, if any? I mean, I don't know. I suffer from jet lag. I you? think we all do. Yeah, yes. but if you cross the Atlantic in two hours and ten, or two hours and whatever minutes, instead of, say, from New York, what, six or seven hours? That's right, yes. What difference does it make to your jet lag? Well, the only difference is it's really like having a very, very early morning. Um, so it does make the day rather longer. Um, but it actually helps you to get back into your sleeping and working pattern more quickly. And the, you have get really confusing things, like one of the loveliest demonstrations, I always say, how wonderful Concord is. We have a, um, a flight called the Breakfast Special from New York, which leaves at 9 o'clock. And of course, so dawn has risen when you get on the aeroplane. You have your breakfast flying across the Atlantic. And as you fly towards the States, it starts getting dark again. And just before landing in New York, dawn rises again. You come from dawn to dawn and That's two and right. a half or two three hours. Two dawns in one day and three right. breakfasts. Now, how long? Would I dare ask how old you are? I'm 29. You can still <laughs> say that as long as you don't, you don't look 29. I haven't asked you how old you are. That's not of any interest, but people like to look at gorgeous, glamorous women like you and say, I wonder how old she really Actually, is. I shouldn't have told you then, should I? No, 29. You'll oh. have to stick at 29 for a while now, but really, <laughs> if you are legitimately 29, you I can am. stay there. Now, you've been flying how long? Nine years. Nine years. And I joined for a year to see the world, so <laughs> I'm world. obviously enjoying it. Tell me, do you, uh, have you always been on the high-speed flights, the Concords and the big ones? No, I started off flying on 707s and VC-10s. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we still have a few 707s left and one VC-10. And I'm still flying on those as well. So I do a few of the Middle East runs as well. How many languages do you speak? French and a little bit of Spanish. I taught myself Spanish, so it's very... It's very but you were educated in France, weren't you? Well, I was, I was brought up in the Lycée France in, in London, which is a French school, and so I learnt my English in French and my geography in French. Tell me, with your uh, poster all over the bleeding world now, this is you. <laughs> Had you not seen that one before? It is. Yes, I have seen that before. I uh, have seen that rather a lot. You've yes. seen that rather yes. a lot. Uh, all over the world. Does it br bring you into problems at airports? Do people use you as a tour guide every time they see you? They do tend to. Well, I, I, the thing I usually get, because I'm on television rather a lot at home in the UK. You mean doing commercials? Yes. Do me a commercial. <laughs> or do you I'll need do a my commercial smile instead. <laughs> okay. Um, the thing I do get is that people, p particularly when I'm not in uniform, they've seen me somewhere before. You know that feeling? Mm. And they whiz up. In fact, a lady whizzed up to me about three months ago and she said, you're the lady on the telly, aren't you? And in one of my more modest moments, I said, yes, I am actually. And she said, I always use Charlie perfume. It's absolutely <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> she thought you were Charlie perfume <laughs> yeah. instead of Ross B.A. <laughs> That's right. So I just said, well, I hope you always wear it when you're flying on British Airways and then clicked. Now, the stewardess business used to be, uh, well, if I say that, she'll hit me. Uh, I'm not very strong, so don't worry. Used to be, I remember when I first started flying commercial airlines many long years ago, that everybody had to be a registered nurse. That's long gone, hasn't it? Yes, it has. But I'm not a registered nurse. It was teaching and nursing were the two were favored professions um, stu that girls became stewardesses, but now it's not really. Tell me a story which you're not supposed to tell me about the crew in the Eastern Bloc city which will not be identified. <laughs> well, it's, it's we, really about the crews, the adventures crews get into while they're abroad and the hazards of flying as a crew member. And this is a story in a, an unnamed Eastern Bloc country. And of course, as part of our Eastern Bloc traveling, we're briefed not to go and blab. I mean, you don't go and say silly and insensitive things. So this crew were having a nice social evening and they'd had a few sips of drink and they were relaxing and all of a sudden they decided that the room that they were sitting in was bugged definitely and they that were going to play a game called hunt the bug so they looked behind you know in in the james bond films they looked behind the pictures and they examined the light bulbs and they felt under the carpet this great big bump so they rolled the carpet back and there was this sort of big contraption with sort of nuts and bolts and so of course the engineer whizzed off and got his spanner out and undid all the nuts and bolts and the chandelier came down in the dining room. <laughs> the That's room true. Below. That would be embarrassing That's to say the least. Absolutely true. Yeah. Now, what are you flying to London? What, what kind of planes will you use in London? We're going to be flying jumbos. That's jumbos. the 747. 747s. Yes. So that'll give us Air Canada to London. It'll give us BA to London. Yes. It'll give us, you call it BA now? British Airways, yes, British BA. Airways. Yes, fine. Uh, we'll have CPR to, they don't go to London no, yet, they do don't. they? CPR go to London? No, no. Amsterdam. <laughs> and other parts of Europe and, and what there of course all the charter people it's amazing how the traffic holds up because for Canadians going to London now 
the dollar is so frightfully weak that mm. it becomes kind of expensive. Well, it does. I mean, I think in the last two years there, there has been, I mean, Great Britain certainly did get rather expensive. Um, I think we did outprice ourselves, we priced ourselves out of the market, and I think in the last year or so we've really learned a jolly good lesson and prices are beginning to come down. Um, but I think as far as the exchange rate is concerned, the clue really is to, the answer is to pay for as much as you possibly can in your own currency. And that's where, da -da -da -da, that's yeah, where that's we come right. in and help, because you yeah. can pay for all your, your bits and bobs or a lot of things and before you leave. And the other thing, leave. of course, to do is in Britain, you don't have to stay in a hundred pound hotel Absolutely. a night in London. The, the bed and breakfast. Yes. Yeah, bed and breakfast are more difficult to find in London, though, aren't they? Oh, they're they? not. They're no, not? there are streets of them. Round Russell I, Square. Yes, and round Victoria. In oh. fact, I live in Pimlico, which is bed and breakfast land, really. On well, one stage of my undistinguished career, I once lived during the war, in Wilton Road, Victoria. Well, there's nothing that's very nice. Is, is that very now nice a place nice area? Yes, why was it not very nice when you lived there? No, and the <laughs> house that my wife was staying in, I was in the army in London at the time, was not exactly what you might call a desirable establishment. Ah. But you forget these things. I wouldn't know about things like that. No, neither did we. It was our <laughs> first encounter with that side of life, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, Rosalind, you're going to be on the flight yourself out of Vancouver. I'm working on it. On the twenty third. Yes, I'm trying. Oh, I'm I think working. you're now committed to come back and go out on the when's the inaugural? The first flight? Uh, the twenty third. Twenty third. So I right. hope I shall be on it anyway. I hope to go over myself in early in April and perhaps do some stuff in Britain for my program in the fall. Fantastic. So you can recommend a good bread You'll and be, breakfast. I was for just me. going to say, yes, I'll recommend a good bread and breakfast for you. Best of luck, Roz. Thank You're you very a charming much. person. You see, I was very nice and friendly and <laughs> warm, as I always am to people like yourself. And best of luck with your new service. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Ross. Much I'll be back with, uh, what's her name again? Gladys after the break. <laughs>